Tonight's lecture is entitled Strange Fire, and it deals with the Holy Spirit, and in the world that we are living in today, the Holy Spirit seems to be very prominent in Christian worship. Leviticus chapter 10 verse 1, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. You see, the Lord had kindled the fire himself, and the fire is an example of his spirit dwelling amongst the people, but they didn't want to take from that fire, they took their own fire, and thus they were insinuating that they had the same capacity as the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So what is the greatest problem at the end of time? Deception. Deception is the greatest problem. And how deceptive will Satan be? So deceptive, says the Bible, that even the elect can be deceived. That's pretty deceptive. This is a major problem. Fire from heaven, and he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, Revelation 13, 13. That means that this Protestant nation, represented by the beast out of the earth, makes fire come down and thereby deceives men. Now, does the religious world, the Protestant religious world, lay claim to fire from heaven? Yes, it does. Fresh fire, miracle convention. Come and see what the Lord can do for you. Lord's gym, bench press this, the sin of the world. This is some of the advertisements that go out inviting people to these power religious movements. Personally, I think there is a blasphemy in that one, but nevertheless. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you, Acts 1 verse 8. This power from the Holy Spirit was meant to equip the people to take the gospel to the world. In other words, this power was meant to serve others and not self. What if we could twist this thing around and there could be more power for self as a sign of acceptance with God? Would that be the same thing as this power? The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. John 14, 15 to 17. In other words, it seems as if the prerequisite to receiving the Spirit of God is a spirit of obedience. And a spirit of obedience implies a spirit of repentance because we were all disobedient to God and need to come in line with God's requirements once again. We need to understand that it is God who cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We need to understand that it is Jesus who gives us life eternal. And we need to develop a spirit of gratefulness which will induce us to keep his commandments, whereby he will empower us to preach his truth to others. That was nice. John chapter 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can you see the centrality of the gospel? The gospel is to be Christ-centered. It must be Christ-centered and not self-centered. It means submission to Christ, not submission to self. 
But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, verse 7. Walk in the light of Jesus. Today, there is another form of power religion. People of power. Convention 94 reports, since the late 60s, the power religion in the world has moved men mightily and literally millions of people adhere to this kind of worship. And so we find that charismatic renewal is the element of worship today. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. And when He, that's the Holy Spirit, is come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. John 16, verse 8. In other words, if you truly receive the Spirit of God, it will lead you to trust only in Jesus Christ and upon His merits. Because you will realize that you are bankrupt, you have no right to anything, because we are all transgressors of God's requirements, and therefore it is only by the merits of Jesus that we can be saved. And the Holy Spirit will convict us of our need for Jesus. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. It's no good saying, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I'm not prepared to accept him as my King. If I accept him as my King, there will be a spirit of obedience. Not because I have to, but because I want to. <laughs> the beauty of true Christianity is obedience out of free will offering. In Christianity, we are total free agents. Why? Because Christ is 100% unselfish. There is no selfishness in him. And obedience is because his requirements make sense, are logical, and they are an expression of his love. A protection, if you like. A wall of protection against pain and hurt. So obedience, I see, not as thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, but thou shalt not. No, 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 thou shalt not. Because it won't even come to mind. That's obedience. Obedience is not fear for retribution. Obedience is love for his tender care and mercy. That's the difference. So true obedience is not something we do out of fear. And the Holy Spirit strengthens us against temptation, so even our good works are subject to Jesus Christ. And I can only trust myself in obedience to him because of his unselfishness. Does that somehow make sense? He is so unselfish that he will never utilize or use my obedience as a form of submission because he's not a power monger. He is gentle and meek and humble. Therefore, any obedience that I render to him must be out of love and not out of compulsion or fear. That's the truth of the gospel. Known sin silences the Spirit of God. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Psalms 51 verse 11. If I continually to transgress God's law... He will not force me because that's his nature. He will not say, I will force myself upon you. That's the spirit of Satan. That's not the spirit of the Lord. The Lord will withdraw. He'll just withdraw. 
Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and shall be innocent from great transgression. So the Lord covers me with his love. That's justification. And the Lord empowers me with his love. That's sanctification. Both of them are from him so that I have really nothing to boast. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams, 1 Samuel 15, 22. But we must not misunderstand this obedience. It's very vital that we understand obedience in the right sense. But the comforter, isn't that a nice name? which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John 14, 26. So besides being one who leads us in repentance to Jesus Christ, he also comforts us. He also gives us hope. So in Jesus there is hope. And in Jesus we can be imprinted with those things which lift up and don't break down. That's what the text says. It's a very beautiful text. The Holy Spirit thus leads us into all truth, and the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we are his witnesses and of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. Acts 5.32, out of love. This is the right relationship. Wanting to do what is right and asking God to help you in this process. So the Holy Spirit will bring individuals to repentance and sin, guiding them in a fuller understanding of the truth about God and Jesus Christ. There are many, many texts to substantiate that. Secondly, to, the fulfillment is to benefit those brought into the church by the gospel witness. So it is to empower people to spread the gospel and the good news and to live the life that Jesus would have us live. And the gift of tongues, for example, was communicated uh, so that the gospel could be distributed in various languages. Acts 2 verse 2, each one heard him in his own language, te idia dialecto, in his own mother tongue. We see the tongues and prophecy are associated and thus serve to communicate the gospel. Everything about Jesus is selfless. Mainline blues, empty churches. You see, in the old days, they used to point to Jesus as the Savior from sin. And people started leaving the church. But other groups started growing dramatically. And so we have power churches with much growth, where there is refreshing, where there is something happening, and people actually see things and perceive them. It all started off with uh, the Pentecostal movement, and this man, David Duplessy, a South African, he was the first president of the Charismatic World Council, and that's why they called him Mr. Pentecost. Some of the symbols they used, triangles and fishes and all of these things, but let me remind you once again of this little chart that we've been looking at regularly where we see that the ancient mystery religions are perpetuated through the Knights Templars, Rosicrucians, the Papacy, to Freemasonry and the Illuminati and that they, according to this chart, control the World Council of Churches and the New Age Movement. We've had a whole lecture of, on that and we see the various philosophies behind this. Let's see if we can pick up some interesting philosophies in the modern thinking of the power religion. This is the book In His Presence by E.W. Kenyon. This was in the early movement of the charismatic movement where this new doctrine started to become known. Let's see how they see things. To know that that defeat was administered to him by our substitute, talking about Jesus uh, defeating Satan, so, to know that that defeat was administered to him, Satan, by our substitute, Jesus, and set to our credit. That's very strange. 
so that in the records of the Supreme Court of the universe, we are the masters of Satan, that Satan recognizes that in the name of Jesus, we are his rulers. When the heart knows this, as the body knows heat and cold, then faith is unnecessary. Isn't there a shift of emphasis from Jesus to us here? We know that God himself put Satan and all his ability beneath our feet, and we are looked upon by the Father and by Satan as masters of the dominion of darkness. In his presence, page 92. Now, this is a book that was distributed vi widely under all the full gospel churches. The Bible says, For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Hebrews 2, 6, 9. What is man that you are mindful of him? You have put all things under his feet. Yes, that was the promise. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus. One day, Jesus will rule also on this planet supreme. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Not we will crush Satan under our feet. This is presumption. This is not biblical. He continues to say, we are taking Jesus' place. He came to destroy the works of adversary. We are completing the work that he began. Doesn't that give us tremendous power? Anything that we can do is nothing without Jesus. So who actually does any work around here? Who can overpower Satan? We are like whips compared to him. You are a victor. He made you one. Get used to it so you can play the part. He made us to sit with him in the heavenly, so representatively we are seated on the throne with God. That's interesting. Because if I look at Revelation 3.21, it says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my Father on his throne. Isn't there some overcoming to be done before we can attain to this glory? So if the head is exalted, the body is exalted with it. So we are exalted. If he conquered all the forces of darkness and left them paralyzed and broken before he rose from the dead, it is as though we had accomplished that mighty work. Now I believe we're going a little bit far here, don't you think? This is beyond gospel. That authority and that ability belongs to the believer. The recreated man is supernatural, he's superman. My Bible says, he must increase, I must decrease. All power has been given unto him. And without him, I can do nothing. That's the gospel. The two are obviously totally opposed to each other. Now, this is a book that has just come out. It's hot off the press. Die Belofte van Sy Wederkomst, The Promise of His Return. And the authors are Dr. Lemmer Duplicy. And he's a professor in theology. He's uh, one of the charismatic preachers. And Isaac Berger, he's the president of a huge charismatic church movement. Nico Lantman, he's the federal pre president of all um, Pentecostal churches. Anton van Dieweter, he is the moderator of the full evangelical church of God. These are the top people in the group. There they all are. You can have a look at them if you want to. And this is what they write on page 158. The old covenant was annulled with the betrayal of Jesus. Of Judas, sorry. But that is kind of strange. How could that be annulled? with the, the betrayal of Judas. I thought the cross changed things. Those who still try to keep the law are not spiritually of age and have not yet received the Holy Spirit. I thought the Holy Spirit convicts of sin and righteousness, and the Spirit is given to those that obey God. But if the law is still read these days, it must be for people that are not of age, that is, for unbelievers. This is the only sense in which the law is still applicable today. Believers live through the Spirit and are not under the law. Galatians 5.25. Very confusing if you confuse the laws one with the other. Gets worse. Believers that try to keep the law are in slavery. 
But believers that live in the fullness of the new covenant are free. Therefore, it is dangerous for believers in the church period to be associated with the law. Churches that read the Ten Commandments on Sundays and in the assembly bring their members under the impression that they are still under the law and that they must try to keep the law. Christians who today try to keep the Ten Commandments hinder the work of the Holy Spirit and undermine the pure essence of the new covenant. That's very interesting. So it seems that we should rather go out and covet and steal and rape and commit adultery and murder and be miserably rude to our parents and dishonor God, and then we become of age? Isn't that what it says? Does that make any sense? That makes no sense to me whatsoever. And these are the top, top people. These are the moderators and the presidents of the big, big churches. This is very strange indeed. Revelation 14, 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Well, this text, whoever wrote this, obviously had a false spirit. No wonder they changed it in the new Bibles. The Toronto experience, what does that entail? Let's read about this. Toronto blessing to soften up Christians to accept the new age. Benjamin Cream, do you remember him? The representative spokesman for Maitreya, the person who is representing Maitreya or the New Age Christ, was recently asked about the Toronto blessing. His response was that he thought the Toronto blessing was a good thing. It is, according to him, the method being used by his spiritual masters to soften up Christian fundamentalists to accept the New Age Christ when he appears. That's a fascinating statement and uh, one worthy of note. So who are the great charismatic preachers in the world today and where are we heading in the world? Well this man over here, Rodney Howard Brown, he was known as the Holy Ghost bartender because, well that's what they call him, because people used to get drunk on holy laughter. This man over here is Reinhard Bonker. Reinhard Bonker is a German preacher who preaches in Africa, and he preaches to millions at a time. He doesn't mess with small audiences. He has huge audiences of two, three million people at a time. So obviously they don't fit into a hall. He hires valleys, and they put speakers all the way down, and then he has healing sermons, which consist of screaming very loudly, at Satan and saying, Satan, I curse you, I curse you, I trample on you, I stamp upon you, I curse you, I stamp upon you, I curse you. And it goes on and on and on until everybody's healed. That's basically what it's about. Laughing in the Lord is another phenomenon which is quite common today. Unzip a heaven, Lord. Emotionalism, much screeching. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. People have been falling over, laughing uncontrollably, rolling around drunk, crying deeply. We have been unable to stop some meetings because the people are praising God. Testimonies are numerous and varied. It's a giant party is taking place. 1 Corinthians 14, 40, Let all things be done decently and in order. This sounds kind of haphazard to me. What about speaking in tongues? And all these interesting things. If we look at a summary chart, slain in the spirit occurs in kundalini yoga. Now kundalini yoga is a very strange form of yoga where the serpent power is coiled up in the base of the spine and has to be released. And it is normally released through the lower body, which, enough said, gives you power in, uh, well, interesting places. Then Subud, Kiyong, Shakers, Pentecostals, they all have the slain in the spirit, but in the Bible, you don't have it. If somebody fell over in the Bible, it was something demonic. Uncontrollable laughter, you'll find in Kundalini Yoga, Subud, Kiyong, Shakers, Pentecostals. Physical jerking, you'll find in Kundalini Yoga, 
the Sabud, Kiang, Shakers, and the Pentecostals. Animal sounds, you'll find them in all of them as well. Spontaneous movement, you'll find them in all of them. Revival-like meetings in all of them, and speaking in tongues in basically all of them as well. In the Bible, it is qualified in Acts chapter 2 as languages to spread the gospel. So, this is a very strange thing. Now, some of the videos I'm going to show you tonight might be a little bit disturbing, but it's good that we can see the comparisons and what actually goes on. So, we will have to ask the Lord to protect us. If we're looking here in the Eastern religions, where you have the hitting of the gongs, these are sun worship rituals, and they're very common, the form of worship that we have in the East, here is Suraya worship. Suraya is also the one that travels through the sky on the 25th of December in his uh, carriage, much like we celebrate um, Christmas. And raising of the arms is very common in Kundalini worship, Suraya worship, and awaiting the rising of the sun, morning worship. This here is the famous, famous Kanarak temple in India, where you have the ladies doing their dances. Now, each hand movement has a meaning, and most of these dances have an esoteric and a erotic function. And they have to do with sexuality, and sometimes exceedingly perverse sexuality. The statues all around this temple uh, are absolutely censorable. So there they are. You can have a look at them. I have had to draw a line through every single one of them because they are literally supersonically pornographic because this is where the power comes from. It is the ancient old sex cult religion of Isis. Now in Kundalini Yoga, what happens is you dance and move rhythmically to a very strong rhythm and then the forces are pushed into the lower parts of the body. And once this happens, well, then you are open for a spirit that enters you and gives you this power. But it's a form of demonic possession. Uh, I don't even know whether I want to show this video, but I'll show it anyway. And those who don't want to look, close their eyes. His brand of yoga called dynamic meditation is a new age combination of Hinduism and psychotherapies. This exercise involving rigorous breathing and hyperventilation is designed to arouse the serpent force called Kundalini, which the gurus believe lies coiled at the base of the spine. did dynamic meditation every day. We also called it kundalini meditation. It starts off with a cathartic breathing, and the reason for it is just to move your energy and to get you out of your head and into your body, and you just breathe. Enough shown. Well, that's what happens in Eastern religions. Now, you might think that that is shameful. Wait till you see what happens in Christian religions and see whether there's much difference between the one and the other. The drum, of course, is very important in this because the drum gives the rhythm. That's why in the sanctuary service in the Bible, a drum was never permitted. The drum was used by the women when, and that was a hand drum, 
But when the soldiers came back from war and it was used for joy and had, was not used in a worship setup. The drum in the African ritual is holy. It is worshipped like a god. The open hand is very important. It is put away. It is worshipped. Open hands into the sky are part and parcel of such worship. Now Cardinal Joseph Suance, Templeton Prize recipient, we're always looking for the connections here. Remember that Vatican II, as we discussed in the previous lecture, said that after 1962, the services had to get livelier. There had to be movement of arms, gesticulation, bodily attitudes, exclamations, internal, external, all of those things had to take place. So Cardinal Sciences was intensely involved with the charismatic movement and was chosen by Pope John XXIII, who led the Vatican II Council, to be one of the chief architects of the Vatican II meetings. He served on all four of its major committees. Sciences stated, Since I have had this charismatic experience, my allegiance to the Holy Father as the Vicar of Christ in the world has been heightened and strengthened. My appreciation for Mary as the co-redemptress and mediatress of my salvation has been assured. My appreciation of the Mass as the sacrifice of Christ has now been heightened. So the spirit that gave him this charismatic experience, did it lead him to the Bible or did it lead him to the doctrines of Rome? Certainly didn't lead him to the Bible, and I don't believe that that was the spirit of truth. Suens also hosted and gave the opening speech at the Second World Conference on Religion and Peace. He received Pope Paul VI's blessing. Delegations were particularly impressed with the important role that religious unity will play in establishing the coming world government. A continual call was sounded for a new world order under Catholic leadership. Uh, the Louvain Declaration status, Buddhists, Christians, Confucius, Hindus, Jains, Jews, Muslims, Shintoists, Sikhs, Zoroastrians, and still others, we have sought here to listen to the spirit within our varied and venerable religious traditions. We appeal to the religious communities of the world to inculcate the attitude of planetary citizenship. So here we're talking about a unity of all these movements. The Temple of Understanding is a very interesting group, again, that is in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Does that ring a bell? Whenever we hear the St. John, my ears prick up. Uh, where at one time a naked female Christ called Christa was hung on the cross. Now, the Temple of Understanding, they say, the, purple of the t purpose of the Temple of Understanding is the worldwide promotion of interfaith dialogue and education to achieve understanding and harmony among the people of the world's religions and beyond. The Temple of Understanding maintains a strong commitment to the integrity of each religion or faith, tradition, and beliefs that each can better remain true to itself by honoring the truths inherent in all traditions. That means everyone must accept what the other one teaches, irrespective of whether it is in harmony with what the Bible says or whether it is not in harmony with what the Bible says. Furthermore, organization affiliated to the United Nations, of course. In the fall of 1998, the Temple of Understanding newsletter explains Interfaith is most fundamentally respect. At the bottom line, it is respecting different traditions, different religions, different faiths. So maybe a slogan we can have is not conversion, but communion. Communion with compassion. Very interesting. Now, I have no problem respecting any religion. Freedom of choice. You're a free agent. You can belong to any religion that you want to. But don't force me to compromise mine to bring it in line with what everybody else is believing that's not biblical and not according to what the Bible says. That's the bottom line. But no, the watchword is not conversion, but communion. So where are we shifting to? We're shifting from a God-based religion to a man-based religion. Alpha. One Christian researcher reveals. Now what is Alpha? Alpha is a state of mind that is to be induced to make you open to this union. And there are many aspects of Alpha which can go very, very deep, and in the higher levels it's nothing other than a form of hypnosis. 
So let's have a look at this alpha course. Between 8 and 13 vibrations, visualization is able to take place. So visualization, and remember Robert Schuller said visualization is a good thing. Vibrations at this frequency are called alpha rhythms. In his very popular book, Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster points out that the meditative visualization, in addition to catapulting one into a divine human encounter, maintains a consistent alpha-level brainwave pattern. So when you have this experience, he calls it a divine human encounter, then uh, you're in the alpha state. The alpha state is associated with other interesting phenomena. The hypnotic trance exists within the alpha level. Now in an hypnotic trance, someone else can manipulate you to do what his will is. So that's why people can run around acting like chickens or doing whatever, because it has been implanted. Because of this, the visualization technique is included within material offering self-hypnosis. The occult trances of Edgar Case are found within alpha. A truth serum drug such as sodium pentothal causes lapse into the alpha state. You can also open the way to alpha using other um, chemicals. Visualization is actually hypnosis. It's a light form of hypnosis. Psychologist Michael Yapko explains, many times therapists aren't even aware that they're doing hypnosis. They're doing what they call guided imagery, which is visualization, or guided meditation, which are all very mainstream hypnotic techniques. So now, would you like to have a style of worship where you are induced to believe that you're having an encounter and does this satisfy a need? Or would you like to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? That is the question. Are we dealing with the human or are we dealing with the divine? So who are the Alpha endorsers? Archbishop George Carey, he was the Archbishop of, Ca of uh, Canterbury. He was the leader of the Anglican Church. 700 of the world's leading evangelists attending Billy Graham's major conference, Amsterdam 2000 in August, attended official events where major presentations of the Alpha course were given top billing. So Billy Graham also enforces Alpha. At Billy Graham's Amsterdam meeting, George Carey said, That's why I want to give a plug for one of your workshops tomorrow. Alpha's great success lies in its ability to take evangelism out of the church into the home and to bridge the gulf between church and community. There's Carey with the Pope. So, interesting little connections coming here. So Alpha, you can take and put it into the home. So you need not necessarily have a full-scale Alpha in the church, but in subgroups you can induce the state by preparing the person, and then eventually he will be open to the Holy Spirit and be able to speak in tongues, and all these things can happen. Now, who are the endorsers of the Alpha Course? Let's have a look at some of the names. Charles Colson, Bill Bright, Tony Campolo, Jack Hayford, Cardinal William A. Keeler, that's Archbishop of Baltimore, Richard Foster, Bill Hybels, very interesting man, and that's Willow Creek fame, Pat Robertson, Louis Palau, George Gallup, David Yonggi Cho, Billy Kim, Cedar, a frequent speaker at the Billy Graham School of Evangelism, Robert Schuler, what would you expect? Nothing else. Leighton Ford, that's Billy Graham's brother-in-law and former vice president of Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. All of these people enforce Alpha. Now, why would I have to induce an altered state of consciousness in order for people to understand their need for salvation or to honor the one who has saved them? The science of witchcraft is based on our ability to enter an altered state of consciousness. We call alpha, where brain waves register at 7 to 14 cycles per second. As mentioned earlier, this is a state of consciousness associated with relaxation, meditation, and dreaming. These are witches telling you that they use alpha. Now, shouldn't light and darkness be as far removed from each other as the east is from the west? Now, let us have a look at the Biblical spirit of Satan. In Ezekiel 28, we read some interesting verses where Satan is used in a symbol of the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre is basically uh, showing the attributes of Satan. So in a sense, it is Satan. 
the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus says the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God. Important principle. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. That's what the devil does. That's what Satan does. But he induces that spirit in his followers. Yet thou art a man and not God. That Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. So don't think that you can fool on the devil or trample on his tail and he'll run away in fear. This is subtle, 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 subtle activity that we are often not even aware of. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver unto thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. This is all selfishness. Therefore thus says the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. This comes up frequently. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw the swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness, and they shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die in the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God, in the hand of him that slayeth thee. So this spirit of, I want to be like the Most High, is the spirit of Satan. Bottom line. Now let's go back to where the mega churches and their teaching come from. The man who started the mega church concept was none other than Robert Schuller. And Robert Schuller, remember, says in his book Self Esteem, and we can pray, Our Father in heaven, honorable is our name. So he lifted himself up to the level of God. Robert Schuller, according to most sources out there in the world, books, web pages, I've just given one here, is a 33-degree Freemason, pastor of Crystal Cathedral and host of the popular Hour of Power television program. Now we've dealt with Freemasonry and what the high level believes. They believe that they are gods. Robert Schuller quotes from Self-Esteem. Notice now carefully. Classical theology has erred in its insistence that theology be God-centered and not man-centered. We had this quote before, but it's very relevant to our meeting tonight. So we need an emphasis from God-centered religion to man-centered religion. The church's problem is that it has had a God-centered theology for centuries when it needs a man-centered one. Isn't it strange that it seemed good enough for 6,000 years, but now at the end we need another one? It would be an insult to the integrity of any human being to call him a sinner. And Jesus knew his worth, his success fed his self-esteem, and then comes this terrible statement over here. But the crux of the matter is, let's shift from God-centered to man-centered, and he says, A hallowed be our name. That's the spirit of? Thank you. That's the spirit of Satan. That's not the spirit of God speaking over there. Let's have a look at his own webpage. This is his, hourofpower.org. That's his own webpage. There he is, teaching pastors how to be, have a power church. 2004, Robert A. Schuller Institute. And here we have the dates. You're invited to discover a fantastic new dream for your church. Who else does he figure on his main webpage? Bill Hybels. That's very interesting. That's the man from Willow Creek. Is your church all God wants it to be? Send your pastors and lay church leaders to the 31st Robert H. Schuller Institute for Successful Church Leadership, which brings together the most prominent pastors who make faith come alive in some of the country's largest churches. And then he mentions two people on the front page of his webpage, when he is a 33-degree Freemason speaking the same spirit that Lucifer had. Like Bill Hybels, 
of Willow Creek Community Church and Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, both graduates of the Institute. That's fascinating. I find that extremely interesting. Those are the two people that run the mega churches of the world. And we need to look into this issue a little bit more carefully and then maybe we can see where the world is heading. May the Lord bless us as we do so. In the previous session we saw that Bill Hybels and Rick Warren, the mega church leaders of the world, are endorsed here by Robert Schuller. Well, he actually goes further. We have to find out where his inspiration comes from. Now, Robert Schuller says, I found myself immediately attracted to Pope John Paul II when upon his election to the papacy, his published speeches invariably called attention to the need for recognition, for recognizing the dignity of the human being as a child of God. Aha! Now remember, there has been a shift in the law, from the law of God to human rights, and the Pope says we must take care of needs. So, I am calling this defining the need. What is the need that individuals have, or what are their needs. And Robert Schuller has found a perfect niche in this. He tries to satisfy the need for self-esteem. Everybody needs to feel that they are important. So if he can feed their self-esteem, then he is satisfying a need, something that people really want, and that fills up the churches. But the question is, is it bringing them the gospel of repentance and salvation in Jesus Christ, yes or no? No. There's been a shift from God-centered to man-centered. And as we have said, Bill Hybels was on his webpage. So let's see where this man comes in. The man who inspired Bill Hybels. The one was Dr. Gilbert Belizikan. He's French-born professor, I don't know whether I pronounced that right, of Trinity College in Deerfield, Illinois. He was there, and he indoctrinated Bill Hybels into this new kind of ministry. But notice what Robert Schuller, a 33-degree Freemason, according to most sources, as we have seen, says about this young man. I was the first person to introduce real church growth to the American church. He, Hybels, became the first guy to take these principles, refine them, maximize them to the ultimate length of their potential. I am so proud of him. I think of him as a son. I think of him as one of the greatest things to happen in Christianity in our time. Bill Hybels is doing the best job of anybody I know. Well, if Robert Schuller says that, then I would be very, very wary. I would look at this very, very carefully. George Barna, a prominent church growth strategist, has said that both Bill Hybels and Rick Warren have gone as far as to say, it is critical that we keep in mind the fundamental principle of Christian communication. The audience, not the message, is sovereign. Okay, who's God then? The audience. The audience is God. If your advertising is going to stop people in the midst of hectic schedules and cause them to think about what they're saying, our message has to be adapted to the needs of the audience. Here we have needs coming in again. Let's satisfy the needs of the people. Here is a critic, C.A. Pritchett. He wrote this book, Pritchett Willow Creek Seeker Services, Grand Rapids, Baker Books, and he says, Is Willow Creek correct in their teaching that a relationship with Christ will provide a life of fulfillment? In a word, no. Personal fulfillment is the dominant goal of the vast majority of Americans. In this context, it is a great temptation for American evangelists to argue that Christianity is a means of a more fulfilling life. The church becomes another place that promises to satisfy emotional desires. To argue 
for Christianity primarily by pointing to its usefulness in satisfying felt needs is to ultimately undercut it. Isn't that correct? Are you not preaching Jesus Christ or are you satisfying needs? He also goes on to say, now, however, rather than Shuler's self-esteem message being promoted as the bait, the bait is rather personal fulfillment. We rejoice that the pure Shulerin heresy, the redefinition of sin, was abandoned. Nevertheless, at Willow Creek, sin is still minimized and marginalized. Heibel's teachings exhibit a strong reliance on psychological categories, not as strongly as Shuler's, but still very real. So, Schuler emphasizes self-esteem, Heibel stresses personal fulfillment, user-friendly doctrine. So basically, there's just another need that has to be fulfilled. What about Rick Warren? He's pastor of a 14,000-member Saddleback Valley Community Church in, in Orange County, and he writes in his book, The Purpose Driven Church, he's saying, he's being used as a manual, of course, in many circles, he has the principle of pragmatism. He says pastors need to learn to recognize a wave of God's Spirit and ride it. If you see something's happening, do it. Or catch a spiritual wave of growth. If it works, it must be right. He encourages young pastors to believe behind old-fashioned church music in favor of jazz or rock or whatever turns your people on. He's all quotes. He encourages churches to to imitate culture, dress down for church, let your head down, be relaxed, come with your sandwich, let's eat something in church. Warren attempts to shelter himself from criticism on this issue. He says, never criticize what God is blessing, even though it may be a style of ministry that makes you uncomfortable. Who says God is behind this? Who says that? Rick Warren uses the very same methodology that Robert Schuller and Hybels uses. Not surprisingly, Schuler praises the book inside the front cover, and Hybels highlights the book on the Willow Creek Internet. Warren spent 12 weeks going door to door surveying the needs of the people. Okay, so now you have a long list of needs. It's a poor community, they can't afford to fix their cars, so we're going to have a needs committee, and the mechanics in the area will come together and help the poor people. That satisfies a need. They get their cars fixed. So it's very useful to come to this church because you have a need that is satisfied. If you have marital problems, we'll have a marital group and we'll satisfy that need. If you have a problem coping with your lawn because you've got kids and all of this, maybe somebody can help and cut your lawn occasionally and we'll have a lawn committee and that will satisfy that need. And in the end, everybody is so busy satisfying needs that to heck with the gospel. Who needs that? We're all satisfied with our needs now. Is that Christianity? Isn't that the job of a social club? Isn't that the job of the government? What do we pay taxes for? Aren't we bringing government functions into the church, yes or no? Taking care of the needs of the underprivileged? That should be their function. I'm not saying that we as Christians shouldn't help the poor. Absolutely. I would never send a poor man away from my house without giving him something to eat or satisfying a need if I see it. But if that becomes my Christianity and I satisfy needs from morning till night, then all I am doing is making that individual dependent upon whom? Upon me. Now what does that do to my self-esteem? It lifts it up because I am needed. And the more I am needed, the more I satisfy those in the community. It's very pleasing in, to be in this situation. But what about Jesus Christ? Where does he fit into all of this? So we have a man-centered philosophy. Figure out what mood you want your service to project and then create it. That's what he said on page 264. We start positive and end positive. That's not a bad idea. We use humor in our services. I have no problem with that. Cultivate an informal, relaxed, and friendly atmosphere. Well, I go to church to worship God. And God says he's an awesome God. Let all the world be reverent before him. I don't go to church to go and kick my shoes off and be relaxed. I'm in the presence of a holy God. So I have a problem with that. We made a strategic 
decision to stop singing hymns in a seeker services. We have attracted thousands more because of our music. Saddleback now has a complete pop rock orchestra. Use more performed music than in congregational singing. So what do we have now? We are satisfying a need for entertainment. Good. The ground we have in common with unbelievers is not the Bible, but our common needs, hurts, interests as human beings. You cannot start with a text. Well, Bill Hybels, you're speaking like Shula. He also spoke like the devil. It's exactly the same. And, I mean, uh, Warren, make your members feel special. They need to feel special. Yes, you are special. You are sons and daughters of the living God. But the only one you can trust that to is God himself because he is unselfish. The only true worship comes from a total giving of yourself through your own will because God never forces you. And you can only entrust your inner feelings to someone like God who is totally unselfish and will never ever coerce you into anything else. If you entrust yourself to the spirit of Satan, you have a problem because needs will never end. The poor we will have with us until the very last day. Is that correct or not? And your need religion will be driven. This is actually Catholicism at its very best. I can pick up poor people and I can make it my religion to do so and I will never, never, never run out of needy people. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former, which is what? Leading them to Christ, leading them to repentance, and truly uplifting them in Jesus Christ. Because Matthew 6, 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Isn't that needs religion? God says, don't take any, need, any thought about that. For after all these things do the who run? The Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We've taken this biblical text now in the modern world, turned it upside down, and said, no, not this way, the other way. We'll satisfy the needs. After all, God, we don't need you. Goodbye, we can do it for you. We are Superman. This is arrogance of the highest degree. Arrogance of the highest degree. And it is so deceptive because it works so beautifully. Everybody is satisfied. The one who receives is satisfied, and the one who gives is satisfied. And the Lord, where is he? Looking on, smiling, and seeing people get lost because they don't turn from sin? You think he's smiling? I don't think so. The style of music you choose to use in your services be one of the most critical and controversial decisions you make in the life of your church. So, you take Oral Roberts' church or Kenneth Hagin's church, the one uses contemporary rock, the other one uses country and western. So, whether you come to serve God depends on whether your style of music is being played. Is that religion? Or is that need satisfaction? Or is that self-satisfaction? You know, better not a morsel of music and honest desire for God than this. I'm not against music. I love music, and I love worshiping God in song. But that's not the issue here. We are replacing something. You must match your music to the kind of people you God wants in your church. No, the kind of people you want in the church. The music you use positions your church in your community. It will determine the kind of people you attract, the kind of people you keep, and the kind of people you lose. If you were to tell me the kind of music you are currently using in your services, I could describe the kind of people you are reaching without even visiting your church. I could also tell you the kind of people your church will never reach. Warren 280, 281, how does he know? 
The gospel changes people. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Not having your own thing there, this style or that style. You think putting Christian lyrics in it is going to change it? Not one iota. Let's talk about music. The non-neutrality of music is clearly recognized by mus musicians themselves. For example, Howard Hansen, famous composer and former head of the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, said, music is made up of many ingredients, and according to the proportion of these components, it can be soothing, invigorating, ennobling, vulgarizing, philosophical, or orgiastic. That's pretty true. It has power for evil as well as for good. It's not neutral. So I don't care what Warren says. He says it doesn't matter what style you use as long as the lyrics are Christian. That's not biblical and it's not even sensible. Defenders of the use of Christian rock music for worship and evangelism maintain that music is void of moral qual qualities. This view is emphatically stated in what is known as the Christian rocker creed. They say that. Uh, published in the popular CCM, they say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all music was created equal, that no instrument to style of music is in itself evil, that the diversity of musical expression which flows from man is but one evidence of the boundless creativity of your heavenly Father. Rock star Jimi Hendrix states the same view most emphatically. You can hypnotize people with the music, and when they get at their weakest point, you can preach into their subconscious minds what you want them, what you want to say. So music's not neutral. Their thought-provoking book, Music in the Ballads, Frank Garlock and Kurt Wurzel acknowledge that a large segment of the Christian community has enthusiastically embraced this music of the world, the associated antics and the philosophy. All three have been implanted in the life of the church. Not only have missed many Christians accepted the music as suitable for praise and worship, but an atmosphere pervades the contemporary Christian concerts, not like, unlike the early concerts of the Elvis era, or rock and roll. Wolfgang Stefani says, Could it be that by fostering a homogenized global music style, a style that is increasingly visible in the Christian music culture, the stage is set for a global religious identity response? Is the music going to bring us all together? Daniel 3 verse 10, Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. All kinds of music. That'll be a, a sign of the end. Here is a song that, uh, or a whole record that was sung by cowboy junkies. And where was this recorded? Captured live at the Church of the Holy Trinity in Toronto, Canada on November 27, 1987. So this is a song that was played in the church. This is church music. It has a sort of nice country western flavor, sounds quite peaceful, and uh, the lyrics are very interesting. But of course, if you are in a sway mood, who cares about the lyrics, right? And this was in the church. He's crazy and he scares me, and I want him by my side. He's wild in his ways, sometimes just plain mad, but I need him to keep me satisfied. Papa, don't cry, it's all right. I see you in some of his ways. You might not give me the life that you wanted. I'll love him the rest of my days. A misguided angel hanging over me. How unlike Gabriel, you're my desire to be. Listen carefully. They're singing to Lucifer. They say they will love him till death. This is in the Church of Toronto, and they're so blatant that they don't even mind singing openly to Lucifer. This is Billy Graham and evangelism. You all know about him. Billy Graham musicians draw record crowds. 
In his 2002 campaign, Billy Graham, contemporary Christian musicians, drew a record crowd in the third night of the Metroplex mission. Estimated 82,000 people attended the event, which included a 30-minute message from Graham and musical performance by Jars of Clay, Kirk Franklin, DC Talk, ministry spokesman Larry Ross said. The audience included about 12,000 who watched the two-hour event from a large television screen in the stadium parking lot. About 5,000 others were seated on the stadium floor. So for hours they sat and they listened actually to the music. Let's have a look at the bands that Billy Graham and the papacy and all the top evangelists use. Stephen, Stephen Curtis Chapman, well, he, Graham used him in his June 2000 crusade in Nashville, Tennessee. Also featured groups like Jaws of Clay, DC Talk, Kirk Franklin, Steve, Stephen Curtis Chapman. There he is. Interesting little hand signs. Kirk Franklin at Graham St. Louis crusade held so-and-so. Once again, we find musical guests include Michael W. Smith, Charlie Daniels Band, Kirk Franklin, DC Talk, C.C. Winans, all of those bands. Michael W. Smith, let's talk about him. He's such a famous singer today in Christian circles. If you look at his album over there, you'll have those sunrise flashing out there. Smith was using marijuana, LSD, cocaine at the same time as he was penning gospel songs. There's the quotes. Everything is under quotes. Nothing here is hearsay. Here are his uh, records, there he's using ruin writing. Now that's used by Satanists, by the way. Smith even has occultic runic symbols on his record album, and the flip side has Smith's name written backwards, which is an occult way. Writing reversal is satanic principle. Master Satanist Alan Crowley taught his disciples to walk backwards, talk backwards, think backwards, speak backwards, write backwards, and even listen to phonograph records backwards to gain insight into the future. So he has all these strange symbols on his record. There's Amy Grant. She's known as the Madonna of rock music because she's not shy to say in a rock concert in church that she's feeling, well, aroused. Forget about that. Interesting lady. How important is that? Part of Grant's aspiration for her songs came from John Denver, of course, was a pantheist involved in EST and pantheism. St. John's University, oh, whenever I hear that name, I get so nervous, gave its highest award to rock star Amy Grant. She is the third woman to receive the Pax Christi Award, often called a jewel in the crown of the Roman Catholic Church. Why is it that Billy Graham has all these nuns and priests working for him in his campaigns and he's using bands that are using LSD, use Satanist symbols, and use uh, pornographic language, even in their services. DC Talk is another interesting band used by Billy Graham, the Pope, all of them together. Graham likes DC Talk, uh, and they get their role models from U2. Now, U2 is an interesting band. Their lead man is Bono, and he was one of the lead singers in Nelson Mandela's, do you remember what it was? 4666 for concert, and they sometimes include Beatles, Doby Brothers songs, so-called Christian concerts, D DC Talk even used use drug addict Jimi Hendrix's song Purple Haze, with references to drugs. Now there's Bono, who they uh, honor very highly, and there's Bono with Bill Gates, and Bono with his band. Bono wears an interesting cross. If you look at it carefully, it has the bent cross. It's the same one that the papacy uses. It's a Satan symbol. It's used by Satanists as well. There he is with the Pope. And uh, so he's obviously a very prominent man. Charlie Daniels Band, another group used by Graham and his crusades. Charlie Daniels. In an interview with Daniels by Huntsville Times, they quoted him uh, using profanity. Uh, a former witch says that his band is famous for his songs about a violent duel between man and the devil. All kinds of interesting things. Country Western perversion is inexcusable. Jars of Clay, by the way, most popular Christian band, patterns their music after the Beatles and other groups. And what else have they done? They perform for Billy Graham. This group has recorded for an R-rated film loaded with live-in lovers, nudity, graphic violence, 83 obscenities. We could go on and on and on. These are good role models for Christianity, don't you think? 
Well, let's have a look at some of the music played when the Pope came along. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience to see the Pope, so I figured I'd better get out here and if I have my chance to do it. It's pretty exciting. It's a, it's a neat atmosphere with everybody gathering around to see He's such a world leader. It's, it's a very special day for St. Louis, I think. He's on his way. He's on his way. I just came up with a new chant for him when I was back there. It goes like this, JP2. Light pop. Who's holy? The Pope? Now it's the next band. DC talk. He's supernatural. Are you sure there's some sort of gospel message in this loud music? Sure, the gospel's there. The gospel's in all sorts of delivery systems. Uh, with our old organ music and the great hymns of the Reformation and afterward, Music is a good carrier for good news, and this is good news. It may not be the good news that we're used to hearing, but these young people understand it. We just got the sign. One minute. One minute, wow. they're telling the people here. One minute is what the crowd was just told. The rumors are correct. Now you see Big Mac himself greeting Pope John Paul II. The young people caught a glimpse of that. And they got even more exciting. The message is a simple one. Holy Father, the young people of America love you. It tells me that tonight the Pope belongs to you. Did you hear one word about Jesus? One? I didn't hear one. This is self-worship at its worst. Using bands, lots of arms swaying. But now comes the saddest story of all. It's going to get a lot worse. As we have said, Benjamin Cream said that Maitreya told him that the Toronto blessing was to soften up Christian fundamentalists. So now let's have a look at the great charismatic preachers and see where they really come from and what they stand for. One of the greatest is probably Kenneth Copeland. When Jesus Christ did his finish, it was, he was not speaking of the plan of redemption. There were still three days and nights to go through before he went to the throne. He, Jesus, is suffering all that there is to suffer, and there's no suffering left apart from him. His emaciated, poured out, little wormy spirit is down in the bottom of that thing, hell, and the devil thinks he's got him destroyed. Believer's voice of victory program. These are all his statements. Now let's go a little further. You don't have a God in you. You are one. Thank you. Now, Peter said, by exceeding great and precious promises, you become partake of the divine class. All right, are we gods? We are a class of gods. That Adam was God manifest in the flesh. God reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean, a reproduction of himself in the Garden of Eden. He did just that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not subordinate to God even. Adam is as much like God as you could get, just the same as Jesus. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifest in the flesh. Well, that is 
serpent language or God language? This is devil language. And it is feeding man's need for self-esteem, for greatness. Kenneth Copeland, what are you saying? The Spirit of God spoke to me and he said, Son, realize this. Now follow me in this and don't let your tradition trip you up. He said, think this way. A twice-born man whipped, G whipped Satan. Wow, Jesus was twice born? Interesting. In his own domain. And I threw the Bible down like that. I said, what? He said, a born-again man defeated Satan. The firstborn of many brethren defeated him. He said, you are the very image of the, uh, the very copy of that one. I said, goodness gracious, sex alive. And I began to see what I'd what been going on in there. And I said, well, now, you don't mean, you couldn't dare mean that I could have done the same thing? He said, oh, yeah. God said this, apparently. Oh, yeah. If you'd had the knowledge of the Word of God that he did, you could have done the same thing because you're a reborn man too. So Kenneth Copeland could have saved you. Did you know that? This is the highest form of blasphemy I've ever come across. What else does he say? And I say this with all respect so that you don't get upset too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. Okay. Well, what does he have in common with Robert Schuller? Everything. Everything. Robert Schuller is a 33-degree Freemason, according to most of the sources, and his teaching is definitely in line with the highest form of Freemasonry. And if you look at Kenneth Copeland Ministries, what are the symbols that he's using? What's that? A compass and a set square. Do you think it's there by chance? I don't think so. I think this man is a Luciferian masquerading in robes of righteousness, deceiving millions. That's what he's doing. As is Robert Schuller. As it seems are all the others. God's on the outside looking in. He doesn't have any legal entry into the earth. The thing doesn't belong to him. Wow, I don't even want to read the rest. It irritates me. Freemasonry, the Mormon movement, Kenneth Copeland, they say the same thing. Adam is our father and our God, said Brigham Young. Copeland says exactly the same thing. There's uh, Copeland's Shout magazine. All the symbols of Freemasonry and some vile ones. I won't talk about that one up there. There's the upside down pentagram and all the symbols that you need to see where this man is coming from. Well, if the symbols don't give him away, his statements certainly do. Well, let's have a look at his hand movements. This is the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Today, Gloria Copeland, my wife, will be concluding her series on the spirit of faith. Now, if you do not know, this is the symbol of the goat, which is used by many Satanists, and it could just be chance, but they all use it so frequently I doubt whether it is chance. So let's have another look at him. Jesus' hand. physical nature is the, he has the traits of his mother. Now, now that was an interesting statement, Kenneth Copeland. Jesus' physical nature. Uh, he has the traits of his mother. Which theology is that? That is Roman Catholic insider theology, and it is Freemason theology, and it's satanic. Simple as that. Because they say Jesus got his attributes from his mother, not from his father. So what he is teaching is not biblical, it is Freemasonry. We him talk some more. We could start getting drunk on the Holy Ghost instead of that <laughs> Jim Bean or something, you know. I pray, God, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, glory to God. Yeah, I get to do this for Jesus. Okay, so he can get drunk for Jesus other than using booze, so he does it for Jesus. But it gets more interesting as we go along. This is probably the largest worldwide charismatic church in the world, the Rima movement. Have you heard of it? It is massive. And uh, it uses the sword, Rima, Bible Training Center, the people in charge, or the founders, Kenneth Hagen and his wife, probably one of the great charismatic founders and teachers in the world today. 
They use the field of the shield of faith over there, which is the same as the Templars used, by the way. They have a huge center down in Oklahoma. The only difference between them and Oral Roberts is the style of music. That's it. The style of music. A huge central stage that can lift up with a band, can be raised and lowered. He used the Masonic symbol on his, uh, his newspaper and he has placed this Masonic obel obelisks on it and he's in the same area as they are. This is Oral Roberts. He uses the upside down triangle. He uses the man with the raised arm in the triangle with the flame on top of that. These are occult symbols. He uses the eastern hands over there. Here he is praying over thousands of letters. He's the one who said, if the Americans don't give me X million by the end of the week, God is going to kill him. I would have tested the Lord on that one. I wouldn't have given him the money. <laughs> Here is his, his uh, buildings. The design is highly symbolic. The pillars which garnish the building represent the pillars of King Solomon's temple. Here we have, again, Freemasonry sneaking in. Again over here, everything is based on the, on the Star of David. All the occult symbols are built into his compound. Now let's have a look at a church service with Kenneth Hagen, the founder and prophet of the Rema movement, the largest worldwide charismatic movement in the world. Stretches from the southern tip of Africa into the East Bloc countries, into China, all over the world and th literally thousands of pastors come to his center to be trained. Kenneth Copeland, by the way. <laughs> okay, very interesting. Let's have a look at just one little bit more. There's something else I want to show you. Drunks fall down. Well, in the end, they jerk around just like they did in the Eastern one. Here's another famous uh, evangelist television preacher, Jesse Duplantis. Let's have a look at him. To attack me. I do know when I start doing things for God in a big way, like buying more television time, building... Did you see his hand movement? Okay. Let's carry on. Hidden channels of communication. God had prepared that man to meet us so we could be a blessing to him. Okay, that man. I wonder who that man is. Could you enlighten us, Jesse DePlantis? And thinks that no one will pick this up. Listen for the words, go and F Satan. I love you. She gets so fast. I love you. She gets so fast. I love you, you all right, very well hidden. You can't hear a thing just about. If you really slow down and have a studio and listen, you can actually say, see he's hiding the name Satan in a so-called speaking in tongues. We'll get a little bit better one. And let him do it again. He says the words, I'm with Satan. I was a reciter of Lauren's words. I want to say was a reciter of Lauren's words. I want to say Did you hear it? I'm with Satan. And he makes that sign. And he hides it in his speaking in tongues. 
gets a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. You're my... See, God's not interested in you being a servant. He's interested in you being a son. But when you become a son, you're a son that serves. See? Did you hear it? But when you become a son, you're a son that serves. See? He's... That's very interesting. So, who are these people that make satanic signs and uh, command millions and millions of dollars to preach the gospel? And Kenneth Copeland with his Freemason signs that says we are all gods, is a friend with Kenneth Hagin, is a friend with Oral Roberts, is a friend with Robert Shula, is a friend with Bill Ibels, is a friend with this one, friends of the... Don't birds of a feather flock together? And where do they get the money to command all these things? This is the, one of the greatest televangelists of all time. And before I get to Benny Hinn, I think it would be advisable if we took just a few seconds break. And let us ponder these things. Who is replacing whom? Are we having a needs gospel, or are we having a Jesus Christ gospel? I want to talk about Benny Hinn. Here is Benny Hinn, probably one of the great televangelists. Now he's a faith healer. He has identified a certain need, man's need for healing. And he's going to supply that need. His philosophy is, he says, quote, Don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything he was and everything he is and ever shall be. Don't say I have say, I am, I am, I am, I am, and I am. That's the same as Robert Schuller said. In other words, this man is saying, he's God. And this person is dressed in white and is going to present this kind of gospel. Does he say we are little gods? So what anointed means, means Christ. In a sense, we are little gods, then aren't we? Well, it was very short. He had says, yes, we are little gods. Now, the Bible says, bless them that curse you. In the beginning of this video, you will hear Kenneth Copeland saying that those who go against his ministry die, and many of them have got cancer. And then we'll watch how Benny Hinn reacts to those who oppose his ministry. An early grave because of it, and there's more than one of them got cancer. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. I place a curse on every man and every woman that will stretch his hand against this anointing. I curse that man who dares to speak a word against this ministry. The Bible says, you can reveal error, but you don't have to curse the person. I wouldn't dare to do that. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Benny Hinn, all of them claim to have spoken to Jesus down here. It was as though someone plugged me into electricity. My entire body was numb under this awesome feeling of power and suddenly a few feet from me I saw the Lord he was uh, six feet something tall maybe six two six three long hair brown light brown hair his eyes I'll never forget his eyes they, they looked right through me in the morning, I woke up and told my mom, I said, Mom, last night I saw Jesus. And mom looked at me and she said, Well, then you, you must be a saint. Okay, he saw Jesus. Jesus appeared to him, as to the others. Now, you can see Jesus in a vision. You can have a vision and be taken up and see Jesus. But Jesus coming down to this earth and appearing to you is not biblical. It's spiritism. Why? Because the Bible says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again to take you to be where I am also, 
In the meantime, I'll send you what? The Comforter, and he will be with you until Jesus comes again. So if someone says he saw Jesus here or there or wherever, it's spiritism. And Jesus warned, do not believe them when they say he was here or he was there or wherever in the inner room. It's not true. So that is spiritism. Now we look at Bonker and Benny Hinn. At the forefront of the charismatic movement, at least in ratings terms, are two very different men. Reinhard Bonker, a German, and Benny Hinn, Palestinian by birth, but now commanding the heights of the fiercely competitive business of American television evangelism. Things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. All things, all things, every need, every prayer, all things are possible. All you have to do is believe. Play that beautiful violin as the gift of the Lord's work, Moses. Thank you. What's happened to the man? Ten years ago, Pastor, he had a logging accident. The power of God came upon him tonight. James McCracken. Sadly, James's condition has deteriorated since Portland. Movement is now so painful, he can no longer dress himself. But James remains so convinced that a miracle took place that he has refused prescribed medication and the operation his doctor now considers imperative. was he catering to? Did you see those poor people sitting there, sick, being ministered to, getting their drips? What is their hope? To be healed. He's catering to a need. He has identified a need for health and healing. And he has deceived these people that he is the one who's going to supply the need. And the people believe the delusion and God is not in it. Because here is another spirit, as we will see in a moment. This was Mesmer when he mesmerized this woman. This is Benny Hinn when he mesmerizes this woman. In an interview, he was told, asked whether what he does is hypnosis and he was confronted when they said to him, what you are doing is hypnosis, and the top hypnotists say that you are very good at hypnosis. Lo notice what he does when the people get slain in the spirit. The anointing. <laughs> to personal charisma and well-tried techniques of crowd manipulation, Benny Hinn adds another dramatic ingredient. Actually, it's an old hypnotist trick. And it's been around for hundreds of years. Fire on the choir. Fire. How does this one? She first looks where she's going to fall. You must let every guard down. First, there's the classic hypnotic induction. You will not protect even your emotions anymore. 
you become completely open. Because the anointing demands that every part of you be open. And at those moments, you are extremely fragile and extremely sensitive. We showed the footage to a professional hypnotist. And he said, and I quote, this is something we do every day. And Mr. Hinn is a real professional. Well, I would react by simply saying that these manifestations do happen. Yet, at the same time, the real, the divine, is still there. He didn't deny it. Now, let's go a little step further and listen to this. Let me play it again for you. Come on, people, let me hear a praise of ours. Come on, people, let me hear a praise of ours. Is he saying, come on, people, let me hear you praise the name of Satan? Let's try something else. This is the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast today. Gloria Copeland, my wife, will be concluding her series on the spirit of faith. All right, remember these signs that they make and how they say these things? Let's have this, a look at this interview with Larry King. Larry King live, Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania, with Pastor Benny Hinn. Hello. Yes, uh, good evening. I believe that there are false prophets out in the world today, and we've seen the televangelists who have fallen by the wayside. No, I was just wondering what really separates Mr. Hinn from the other TV evangelists out there. How do they know? It's quite simple. See, Jesus said, by the fruits you will know them. And uh, just watch the person's fruits. Okay, his own words. Watch the person's fruits. What are his fruits? Let's ask him. This is a video of a party held in his house. There he is. Now he's giving the heroin to his worker. This man dies that night of an overdose of heroin. simple. See, Jesus said, by yes. the fruits you will know them. And uh, just watch the person's fruits. If they uh, display uh, a clean life, a Christian character, if they show true Christianity, then they're really for real. It's interesting. Nothing happened to him thereafter. Are these people beyond law? that they can be seen to hand out drugs that even lead to overdoses and the deaths of people and nothing happens? What else does he do? And a man was raised from the dead on the platform. That's a fact. People. I was in Ghana recently, preaching one night. They brought a man. And this man was put uh, uh, on the platform and he was dead. The man was dead. And uh, it was a very scary thing. Now, I saw his body being picked up, you know, from hand to hand to put him on the stage mm -hmm. behind my back. The man was getting up and moving. Oh, my, oh, my. Do you literally believe that someone has been resurrected on the program? I have not seen it. In that one case, we did hear about it. So in the one story, he says, I saw it, I watched it, and when cornered, he says, sorry, I didn't, I didn't see it, I just heard about it. What about healings? Correct you for the last time. I do not say to the individual, you're healed. They are telling me they've been healed. Believe Ferguson, you are healed by the power of God. So he's lying. One more thing, this is his wife. 
If your engine is not revving up, you know what you need? You need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. Did you hear what she said? She said you need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. Is that reverence for God? So these preachers say, I am God. These preachers use hypnosis on people. These preachers do all the things that we would imagine people do when they want to deceive people. I believe they are. What are they? Wolves in sheep's clothing. I believe that the top preachers, many of them, not all of them, there are probably many, many sincere good people out there, but many of them are planted, are high insider trained agents, high up in Freemasonry, trained by the Jesuit order to deceive Protestantism into accepting a lie and to start adopting a human-based needs religion rather than the religion of Jesus Christ. This is an onslaught not only against you and me, this is an onslaught against Jesus Christ of the highest order. It is sidetracking him and is putting him where they want him, in the dust. And I believe it's time to stand up for Jesus Christ and these poor people that have been deceived. It is time that people realize their only hope is Jesus Christ and no one else. Only Jesus can save you, but you have to admit that you need him. And he will satisfy your needs non-selfishly. If you want him only because you need a need satisfied, what kind of a relationship is that? How would you like to have a relationship with someone who comes to you only so that you can satisfy one of his needs? or her needs. Would you like that? Would you like to have a relationship with someone that has an ego trip because he's capable of filling a need? Some people are high on need filling. They go and find all the weak people in the world and fill their needs, and this gives them a kick. Nothing wrong with helping the poor, nothing wrong with all of that, but if you so fix that person's attention on yourself that you become the great hero, start, rather than in humility helping someone, then there's a problem. Eyes should be fixed on Jesus. If you have a problem with that, rather give and help in secret than be praised by men. Rather give in secret. Rather go and put some money into somebody's post box who's poor and let no one know about it than knocking on the door and say, you know, I can see you've got needs. Here they are. And people worship you and you feel great and they feel great. Maybe they feel even miserable. Who knows? But if they got it in the post box and they never knew, they'd be surprised and they'd have no one to thank but whom? God. And who put the thought in your mind in any case to do good? There's no one that does good. No, not one. Only Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. This is probably the greatest healer in the world today, bigger than Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn does it on television. This man, they fly to him in jumbo jets. TB Joshua, I was sent to earth to save the world. What arrogance. He's another one like Benny Hinn who wears white. He has his sign, Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. He has those Arabic words over there. Actually, it says there's no deity except Allah. Very interesting. Isn't that what Freemasonry does in its highest level? The divine person in me can do a million things simultaneously. I can appear to thousands of people in their dreams in any part of the world to set them free of their sickness, problems, and afflictions. Oh, so, now he's the needs filler. He's the one who fills the needs. You see, it doesn't matter whether it's as blatantly diabolical as these things or whether it is in lawn mowing and nuts and bolts. If you have someone that you want to help, don't tell him that's Christianity. Tell him that your Lord installed you to help him. Your Lord 
made you so that you want to help people. But don't make that your religion. Your religion is Jesus Christ, and my religion should be Jesus Christ. There is no other. This is his center, and here come thousands and thousands of people to be healed. He calls himself TB Joshua, Joshua Yahweh the Savior. And he, had, he likes to be addressed as Emmanuel, God with us. These people are on an ego trip. And he likes to have the song sung, Emmanuel our God. It's repeated over and over. Whilst driving out a demon, Joshua asked the demon, and who am I? And the demon answered, you are Jesus the Christ. Jo Joshua laughed and called others and said to him, hear what this demon says? I am Jesus the Christ. Well, I don't like this video, but I'll show it anyway. Speaking in tongues in the background. This is a charismatic preacher, a very prominent one. He brings whole plane loads to TB Joshua. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. This woman supposedly never walked in her life. I've seen enough. Did you see how she walked? Like this. What, did, what happened when Jesus healed someone? He jumped up and jumped for joy and he was fully healed. This is deception of the highest order. 2 Thessalonians chapter 9, verse 11 reads, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan. Displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those that are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. What's the truth? Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. All thy commandments of truth, thy law is truth, Psalm 119, Obedience and Christ, that is the way. Jesus calls us to repentance and a walk with him. And then, you know why? Even if you stayed crippled, you have joy. Because you'll have life eternal and you will not be a cripple on the other side. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. This is God's permissive will. This, you must understand God's will. It's God's will, God's permissive will, God's ultimate will. God permits it because they refuse to want Him. They want their needs filled. Leave me alone with your repentance. Just give me what I need. And they are served this up in a package which is so delusionary that people believe it. So that they will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Wolves in sheep's clothing. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. I would like to make an appeal that we serve Jesus Christ in righteousness and in truth that we look at our own hearts and say, am I really a good, wonderful person, or have I got faults? Is there one here who has not sinned? Is there one here who has never done anything that needs forgiveness? Is there anyone here who has not suppressed someone else for his own purposes? Is there anyone here who has not manipulated someone else for his own purposes? I doubt it. 
We all need the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Total, unselfish love. Only Jesus can give it. And when I come to church, I come to church because I'm grateful. And I'm grateful to Jesus. And I come to church not to have my needs full. I don't want to be a bread and fish Christian. Bread and fish, God will provide if I serve him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And my God shall take care of all your needs. I've had many times of poverty in my own life. I've been in situations where I've literally faced death by violence many times. People who don't live in my country don't even understand that. But I know what it means to trust God. I've learned it by experience. And I know he comes through every time. He has a bad habit of coming through in the last second, but <laughs> he comes through every single time. And why does he allow things to go to the last second? So we learn to trust him, no matter what the situation. You know what? I've come to love his character. He never, ever forced me to do anything. Never, ever, ever in all my life has Jesus Christ forced me to do anything. Never. That is why if I should ever have the privilege of kneeling before him, I would take the crown and throw it at his feet. Why? Because I don't deserve it. He deserves it. And what will he do? He says, nah, you have it. And he will never remind me of anything that he did for me. Salvation in Christ is so complete that we stand one day before God as though we had never sinned. Our sin will be removed from us as far as the east is from the west. If you ask him, what have I done? He says, I can't remember. We will never feel like nothing when we are with Christ. We will be sons and daughters of God, free agents, but obedient and submissive to him by our choice because of his character. And if we can understand that, what life we would have in our churches, what beautiful worship we would have in our churches. We wouldn't come to church arguing about whether we want country and, ro country and western, rock or heavy metal or this, that or the other. No, no, no. We would come to church filled with a love for Jesus Christ to say thank you to him for all his blessings. If only Christianity could take hold of him once again and get rid of all the lies. What a revival we will see. May God bless you and keep you as you ponder these things. Amen.